Holy Spirit, we welcome you here to this place this morning. We pray work in our hearts. Lord, transform our minds by the power of your word. Lord, Lord we pray, anoint your service this morning. We worship you all.
you're my prince of peace, and I will live my life for you. that you are not 
solely man in the incarnation, but the Lord Jesus retained his divinity. You are God, as we have just sung. You are God alone. There are no other gods besides you. I know we talk about other gods. We talk about gods that men make and God, gods that men imagine and that gods that men formulate in their minds and in their hearts. But when all is said and done, the Lord our God is one and He is the only one. And from before the foundations of the earth, you knew every person in this room by name. You fashioned them and you formed them according to your perfect will. And you are calling us to you now by your Holy Spirit to come near to you because that provision has been made because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come near to you now, Lord Jesus, and we come bringing our heartaches, bringing our burdens, bringing our needs, bringing our sicknesses, and we bring them to the foot of the cross, and we declare we have no might against these things. We have no power against these things, but you have declared to us that we may bring them to you. We may lay them at your feet and that we might make our requests known with thanksgiving. And so, Father, this morning, if there is someone here who has a burdened heart, I pray, Father, that you might be the lifter of that burden, that you might lift that heavy heart, and you might replace it with the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. Father, I pray this morning if there's someone here who's facing a, 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 an issue or a problem uh, in their life, a circumstance that is just greater than they are, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would take note of that circumstance and that in the midst of that thing, you would come and you would stand with them, you would whisper in their ear, I'm here. You are not alone, and I'm going to see you through this thing. And when you come out the other side, you're going to be stronger. Your faith is going to be greater. Your patience, your endurance is going to be mightier because I've walked through this thing with you. Lord, there may be those this morning here who have needs. They may be financial needs. They might be housing needs or groceries or gas in the car, or repair for the car, whatever it is, Lord, we don't know all of the needs that are in this place. But I do know what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, My God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. There might be some dear Father who are physically infirm. They have a disease or they have some infirmity. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus, touch every single body with your healing hand. May we reach out as that woman did and touch the hem of your garment in faith and everyone be healed in their physical body. May everyone be healed in their sadness of heart. May everyone be healed in their depression. May everyone be healed of the spirit of fear and deliver. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray also we have students in our midst, some who are leaving for college, leaving home, going to be out on their own. And we pray, Father, that they would be, have a sense of your presence, your spirit, your safekeeping to go with them. That as they move into that new phase of their life, they might feel the might and the presence the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God to see them through. And we know, Father, that many will have their faith challenged. Father, I pray for a strength of character that will cause each of our young people to be able to stand up with a spine of steel and stand for the faith that they have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this every family in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to see all of you here today. Let's have all of the little children who are going to be going down to Sirius Kids Church.
have any little children who are going out to the church. Here comes Mitchell. He's ready to go. Hey, Mitchell. How are you, buddy? And here comes Debbie and Maddie. They're coming. They're coming. What are you, coming one at a time? There's three of you. Come together. Oh, oh. And there's little Riley in his cast. He's got the Incredible Hulk cast on his leg today. We thought that that might slow down his mobility a little bit. It did not. <laughs> Let's pray. What we're going to do is I'm going to lay hands on these children and pray for them as they go downstairs to Kids Church, and then we'll receive our offering. You might as well let it go, Noah. You might as well. And then uh, we'll receive our offering and look into God's Word this morning. Father, we thank You and we praise You this morning for Your goodness, Your graciousness to us, Your mercies which are new every day. And we pray, Father, a special blessing upon these children as they go downstairs for their ministry and as we receive uh, the finances that are needed to continue to move this ministry forward. Father, we pray not only for an adequate supply, but a full supply of wisdom that we might be faithful and prudent in how we manage the assets of the kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Children, you may go. Have a great time. And we'll receive our offerings.
I'm, I think you'll need uh, traveling mercies for travel in the United States. I've seen a couple of Facebook entries in that regard. Um, he'll need rest and uh, recovery, rest and recreation while he's up here so that he'll be strengthened and renewed when he goes back to Cuba. And especially, uh, he needs an anointing to be able to spread the word about what he's doing uh, to the people in the churches that he visits. I'm looking forward to his visit here, which I understand to be uh, at the same time as our mission celebration. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I also want to call attention to the photos of the uh, center in La Legua that has been built up over the years. Uh, a lot of the construction work as the result of mission teams, some of which have been from this church. Um, I remember going on the first uh, mission team that went to Piura and seeing what looked like nothing but a barren backyard with uh, dirt that you can't dig in. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, it's come a long, long ways, and you can see the progress in the photographs on his website. Um, I'm praying also for. Uh, for direction, encouragement um, to Pastor Julio and for Pastor Benito, speedy resolution of the family issues that have uh, plagued him. And I also want to pray for um, that. I also want to pray that no adversaries of any kind would impair the work that John Edwards is doing, the work that the Lord is doing using John Edwards as his agent. And I mean adversaries of any kind. There are, there are powers and principalities wherever the kingdom is moving forward. And there are consequences of human fallenness that get in the way. And I don't want to necessarily make a distinction between those two, but I want to call attention to both of them. Okay, so if you'll uh, join with me in prayer for John Edwards and for the people that are to come to the kingdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Great Commission. We thank you for having given the Great Commission to John Edwards and for putting it into his heart to go to Peru and to the people of Piura to reach people who have uh, never heard your gospel or who have heard it in a very, very distorted form in a way that uh, really didn't bring them into a salvation relationship with you, that uh, as a result of his ministry, uh, people could understand who you are, come to you, and grow in faith. I thank you for that work. I thank you for, especially for the people that John Edwards has already been instrumental in bringing to the Lord. And I pray for the people that you are going to save using John Edwards as your agent. I pray for Pastor Julio that you will continue to anoint, direct, and encourage him so that uh, he can continue to do the work of a local pastor. I pray for Pastor Benito that you will resolve the issues that uh, have arisen in his life. I pray for defense against the adversary, for uh, John, for the pastors, and for all who come into his learning center. Lord, I thank you for all of this. I praise you, and I express open faith that your work there has just begun. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate it. It was my intention <clears throat> to continue in our series in the book of James, but I really had a very strong sense in my spirit that I wanted to bring another word this morning, particularly in light of some of the events of our week at family camp last week. Now, I know I watched the video from last week, and I know Pastor Brian gave you a pretty detailed uh, picture of what was going on, but it's, it would be kind of hard to get it if you weren't there. It was a very special move of God. And so the Lord has given me another word this morning, and I want to share it. Uh, and then we'll pick up, at some point in the future, we'll pick up a series of James. I want to read for you 
the account of the writings of a fellow by the name of Celsus, who somewhere around the year 178 AD launched a bitter attack against Christians and against Christianity in general. This is what he said. He said that the Christian view, his view of the Christian faith was this. He said, let no cultured person draw near. None wise, none sensible, for all that kind of thing we count evil. But if a man is ignorant, if any is lacking in sense and culture, if any is a, is a fool, then let him come boldly to Christianity. Because it is for fools. And of the Christians, he further wrote, we see them in their own houses. I don't know why this is particularly impressive. Wool dressers, cobblers and fullers, the most uneducated and vulgar persons. He said Christians are like a swarm of bats. They are like ants creeping out of their nest. They're like frogs holding a symposium around a swamp. They're like worms cowering in the muck. For a moment I thought I was reading a news script from CNN. <laughs> Hello. My name is Michael. And I am saved. I wonder, I wonder if there's anyone else here today who would like to introduce themselves. Don't Hello. raise your hand. Hello, I am Lynn and I am saved. I am George and I am saved. My name is Diane and I am saved. I am Charlie and I am saved. saved. That's good. Do it all at once if you want. To. I'm Sherry and I'm saved. Amen. Harry, I'm saved. I'm John, I'm saved. I'm Linda, and I'm saved. Praise God. I'm Jackie, and I'm saved. I'm Gary, and I'm saved. I'm Dan, and I'm saved. I'm Mike, and I'm saved. I'm Mike, and I'm saved. I'm John, and I'm saved. Praise God. I'm Tom, and I'm saved. I'm Linda, and I'm saved. I'm Ruth, and I'm saved. I'm Katie, and I'm saved. Praise God. I'm Ron, David, and I'm saved. Amen. During the week of camp, at some point during a love feast, which is our morning meeting, our daily, basically our daily devotion that we start, I introduced the young people to a common practice in Kenya, where I'm known to travel from time to time. We had a powerful move of God on the grounds during this 124th consecutive year of encampment at White River, particularly among our youngsters. And after I got home, I noticed that this greeting was popping up all over the place on social networks, such as Facebook. And I'm blessed to see our young people from Vermont to Nevada, from Connecticut to Maine, standing up and declaring that they are a follower of Jesus Christ. I also took note that for some, the pushback was immediate from old friends. They learn that our friends in the world will tolerate almost anything from us except an unashamed, unapologetic stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. It would appear that some lost friends, I know of one little girl, not from around here, she learned within a couple of days at the end of camp and her stand for Christ, that her father, her estranged father, was filing for custody to rescue her from this home and this situation that was clearly brainwashing her. By the way, I just want to go on record as saying that what many of us received at camp this week was in fact a brainwashing. And I highly recommend it from time to time. 
<laughs> that we go and sit under the water of the Word of God and get our brain washed. Amen. Because I don't know about you, mine needs a good washing from time to time. And I want to say to all of you youngsters, some of you who are sitting up in the hinterland, as usual. <laughs> I did notice the other day I went up and way on one of the back rows was a piece of electronic equipment all taken apart. And there was a crude sign there that says, Sunday morning entertainment, do not disturb. <laughs> I'm grateful that none of those young people are sitting there so that I can identify you with that sign this morning. <laughs> But I'm blessed by your testimony and I'm blessed by the stand that you've taken. I plan to continue, as I said, on the series of James uh, that we've been doing, but I just want to take a break and share another message with you to all of you, but particularly to those young people, teens and some a little bit older than teens, who have taken this stand for Christ. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 1. The book of Romans chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 8, but the previous seven verses are basically Paul's introduction to this most important letter, this letter in the New Testament from which we get the bulk of our, God, of our doctrine and what we believe about the atonement. But he gives a rather lengthy introduction, and in verse 8 he begins his outline, his outline of the book, and we're going to read it together. He says, first... I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Well, what a testimony for a church, isn't it? That Paul would write to this group of basically Jewish believers who had fled Jerusalem in the face of persecution and it ended up in Rome by one reason or another. And Paul says, I am blessed. I'm blessed to hear and I thank God for you that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length I may have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both you, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you but was, was hindered that I might have some fruit among you also, even as I have among the Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. What I want to do this morning is unpack this a little bit for us, hoping that all of us will receive some edification from these verses. But I particularly uh, want to address those youngsters, those young people, those young men and women in our midst, many of them have so powerfully identified with Christ. In the book of Romans, Paul is not writing from Rome. He is writing to Rome. He desires and has desired for a long time at this point to visit Rome. He knows that there is a church there that is taking a, a public and a powerful stand for the cause of Christ. In Rome, in the power center of the world, in the governmental center, uh, center of the world, in the world, in the part of the world from which everything is controlled, there is this little band of believers who are standing firm in the midst of much persecution, standing strong, so strong that Paul writes, your faith is spoken of throughout the world. They had made no secret of their stand for Christ. 
Paul wanted to go there. He wanted to be with them. He wanted to encourage them. He wanted to teach them. He wanted to impart spiritual gifts. And while I'm not separated uh, from <clears throat> the people that I'm really addressing this morning, I want to share some of the things that Paul shared with the Roman church, and I want to share it with you. Not just those who were at camp and had an experience at the altar, but all of us who are taking a stand. Because many of you who stood up this morning and introduced yourself and declared that you were saved, you weren't at camp this week. But you picked it up. Verse 8 says, First, the first thing I want to do, is I want to thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. During the morning session at camp, I shared with you earlier, I had the young people's group uh, taught them a common greeting that is used in Kenya among believers. Many times when a person introduces themselves to you for the first time, they will speak their name and then they will add on the description they will say, hello, I'm Michael, and I am saved. To a stranger, they immediately identify themselves as a follower of Jesus Christ. There's no shame. There's no secrecy about their faith. They want you to know. They want you to know that they've made a commitment to Christ. They want you to know that there is a distinction possibly between you and them. They want you to know that they, they have identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. I was sitting at my computer the other night uh, and uh, doing, catching up on some email and answering some, some, some uh, issues with regard to our, actually our work in Kenya. And... Uh, one of our kids came online on Facebook, and this is what they said. They posted in their site. In the light of what we were taught at White River, this just needs to be said. And he gave his name, and he said, I am saved. I personally believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In just a few keystrokes, he announced to the world where he stands in relationship to Christ. All of his friends knew it. All of their friends knew it. And all of their friends' friends knew it and knew where he stood with Christ. Because whether or not you understand it, and some of us, you know, we're still back with stone knives and chisels. Uh, social networking today is like a bulletin board to the world. If you don't want the world to know it, you had better not post it. As some of us with blushing faces have figured it out. If you don't want the world to know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you best not be putting it on Facebook because it will do what we often call, it will go viral. What really blessed me is that within a few minutes, a number of his fellow campers had picked it up and they began introducing themselves and declaring their stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. It was like somebody had waved a flag and the army began to rally around the flag. Soon after that, other believers who weren't at camp, who didn't know what was going on, who hadn't been a part of it, began to pick up the introduction. And within a matter of an hour, literally, this thing had spread around the world, and this young person, bolstered up by those who had stood with him, literally announced to the world, I personally believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say with Paul, I thank God for you all. For your faith is proclaimed around the world. Now, let this be a warning and an exhortation. A warning and an exhortation. Because you have made this stand so publicly, so brazenly, Every skeptic will be watching you now, waiting to see you back off, back down, or give up so that they can use you as an example to say, see, it doesn't work. It doesn't last. You're now going to have to man up and stick to the fight because the eyes of the world are upon you. But let me also give you an exhortation. Not only the eyes of the world are on you, so are the ears. And I want to exhort you now to speak boldly. 
in the New Testament after a particularly difficult time, a time of arrest and beating, the disciples, the apostles went back to their company and they reported the great threat that was against them and they prayed a prayer, part of which is this, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may speak the word of God. By stretching your forth your hand to heal, signs and wonders may be done by the in the name of your holy child Jesus. And the Bible says, and when they had prayed, the place where they were was filled with the Holy Ghost. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the Word of God with boldness. You have not only the eyes of the world, but you have the ears of the world. They're listening. You must end your foolishness as children. That's right. Because you are no longer a child. You have just by your declaration personally entered the fray. And you have the years of the world. You must become grown up men and women you have proclaimed yourselves to be. For now it is you that has raised the banner of Christ. And now you have ears listening for you to speak the truth. I thank God for each and every one of you because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. But Paul goes on to say in verses 9 and 10, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. You need to know, those of you who have taken that stand, those of you who have proclaimed, you've, you've stuck it out there for the world to see, that there are many who are now praying for you. We've seen the answers to our prayers right before our eyes. Most of you know that the burden of my heart is with my eyes to see a new generation of soldiers arise up who are not ashamed of the gospel. I believe we're seeing that right now. And I cannot lay down without praying for you. Every time I see one of your names pop up on my computer, I pray for you. Every time I go through a record of camp and looking down some of the paperwork that we have to do and I see your name, I'm praying for you. And there are others praying for you. Ever since last Saturday night, when we had almost 70 young people at the altar who stood before the Lord at the altar of the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, I will follow you even if I die. I've been praying for you. Every time I see one of you take a stand and I see the pushback coming from the world and from your friends, I pray for you. I pray, don't back down. Don't give in. Because now you, you have someone who wants to engage you on this matter. Don't, don't bend. Engage. Every time I see one of you take a stand on Facebook, I pray for you. Every time I talk to one of you on the phone, I pray for you. I saw one walking down the street the other day as I was driving. I prayed for you. You need to pray for me because I went right through a four-way stop sign while I was praying for you. I'm praying for you, not that it will be easy, not that it will that the, that the pressure won't come. I'm praying that the pressure will come because those are the opportunities to speak for Christ. Paul suffered so many things and we see it recorded all through the New Testament. He did not see those as persecutions. He saw those as opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus. I've told the story so many times. When Paul finally did get to Rome, he was in Rome under house arrest. During the latter part of his arrest, he was cruelly and brutally chained to two guards every day in 12-hour shifts. But Paul was not the prisoner. <laughs> Those guards that were chained to him were the prisoners. Now that we're here, we have nothing to do. Let me tell you about Jesus. And we know in the, in the historical record that during the imprisonment of Paul in Rome, an inordinate number of the Praetorian Guard confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because you see, Paul didn't see it as imprisonment. He saw it as an opportunity to take the gospel to Rome. Don't see the pushback from the world. Don't see those who mock and who ridicule. Don't see this as persecution. See it as God opening a door for you. See it as God giving you an audience who's ready to engage. I 
I'm praying that you have a backbone of steel and convictions that are unbreakable. Praying that you will be unbowed before the ridicule of your friends, that you will be unmoved by the doubt of those around you. I'm praying that nothing will turn you from your established course and that moving forward, we are watching the leading edge of a spiritual awakening that could sweep across New England and eventually all across America. The Word of God says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. I look at our little camp meeting and I see 50 or 60. You know we had over 130 kids under the age of 18? In a very, very intense time of ministry that impacted a number of them uh, so powerfully. You know, so many of the great movements of our past have begun with one man or one young man or one young woman who has been who has had an, a dynamic encounter with God and it has changed them and they have been the instrument of change in their generation. I am praying for you today that you are the instrument God will use to, to bring change in your own generation. And listen to me, young people. God is not going to use old guys like me to reach your generation. He's going to reach you. I'll bend down under the rails so I get everybody's eye. He's going to use you. I'm praying that you realize that what you have begun could literally change a nation and turn it back to God. Or failing to continue in your walk, it could exist as just another emotional moment at summer camp that will mean little and will accomplish nothing. Verse 11 says, For I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to strengthen you. See, Paul was not only praying for them that they would be strong. He was not only praying for them that they would have a clear witness. He was praying for them. He was desiring to come to them so that he could lay hands on them, so that he could impart spiritual gifts to them. And notice what he says. Spiritual gifts to strengthen you. This morning as we end this service, I'm warning you now so you can run now if you want to. I'm going to invite our young people to this altar and I want to surround them with parents and friends to pray for them. I want us to lay hands on them and pray for them the impartation of spiritual gifts upon this generation of new and godly servants. Faith, healing, miracles, tongues, interpretation, words of knowledge and prophecy, preaching, teaching, evangelism. I believe this is their hour and we want to release them into that ministry. Listen, you don't have to wait until you're old. God is calling you now. If you're old, you don't have to bemoan the fact that you're not young anymore. God is calling you now. You don't have to wait until you're out of school. My goodness, don't start serving Jesus after you get out of the place that needs servants of God. Serve Him now. And you need the gifts and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to empower you. You cannot do it on your own emotional fervor. You cannot do it on your own emotional fervor. It has to be the anointing of the Spirit of God. A couple more things. Verse 14. Paul says, I am a debtor. I am a debtor both to Greeks and barbarians, to wise and to foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel. When Paul says he is indebted to Greeks and barbarians, to wise and foolish, he is saying, because he has received such a wonderful gift. Do you remember the history of Paul? He was an opponent of Christianity. He was one who resisted Christianity. He was one who fought, even sought to kill and to murder. He was one who sought to have them arrested. And God arrested him and brought him out of that sin of religion. And brought him into a relationship with God. He said, because I've received such a wonderful salvation. Because God so richly has saved and redeemed me. I am under an obligation to preach the gospel to all men. Because God so wonderfully and has so wonderfully transformed you. You are under obligation. Now listen to me. I know there's a whole wing of the church today that doesn't like to talk about obligation. 
We are set free by grace, not in my record book. We are obligated by grace to preach the gospel to those who have not received it. You dare not keep it to yourself. You dare not hide it under a bushel. You dare not go back to school and hide your faith to avoid ridicule. You dare not pretend you're like everybody else because now you are indebted to all men to share with them the truth of the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I like verse 16. I can almost see Paul trying to write from a standing position. I'm not ashamed of the Gospel for it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes. Now let me say a couple of quick things about that. First, particularly for some of you young people, your friends are going to ridicule you and mock you. They are going to try to make you ashamed of your faith and your new stand. But I want to say to you, you have no reason to be ashamed. The rapist needs to be ashamed. Drunkards and dopeheads wallowing around like animals need to be ashamed. The thief should be ashamed. Lying politicians should be ashamed. Abortionists should be ashamed. Adulterers who defile the marriage bed should be ashamed. The animal who molests young children should be ashamed. Gossipers and backbiters should be ashamed. But the man of God, the woman of God, has no cause for shame. That's right. Because you are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. My sins have been forgiven and I'm not ashamed. My wicked past has been erased and I'm not ashamed. My foolish words and deeds have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and I'm not ashamed. You should really learn the definition of the word that is translated shame here. It's really interesting as I was just doing some research for this. The word here in the Greek language refers to someone who has acted upon false assumption or misplaced confidence. And this is what the world believes about you and I, that we are acting, we are living, we are basing our eternity on, fault, on, on false assumptions and misplaced confidence. That we have confidence in a God who does not exist and we, we look forward to and take comfort in uh, a salvation that does not work. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. My confidence is in a real Savior who died a real death on a real cross at a specifically, historically verifiable place and time witnessed by many souls and documented in the annals of history, declared by most historians the most thoroughly documented event in human history is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is not misplaced confidence. It's a historically verifiable fact. My faith is based upon the word of the one living God who acted upon, acted upon by the living word and sealed by God the Holy Spirit. And I'm not ashamed of that gospel. For it's the power of God. Only the gospel can transform human nature. Only the gospel can change a man's life. Only the gospel can completely eradicate a man's sin. And only the gospel can commute my death sentence and give me eternal life. Amen. The only hope for your friend has, that one who mocks you and who ridicules you, the only hope he has is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only hope your lost loved one has is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not let anyone bully you into submission or silence. There is no other hope for the men, the men and women that you interact with. You cannot quit. You cannot back down. You cannot shut up. You cannot fall silent. God has called you and He has instilled in you a message of hope 
for a world that has abandoned hope. And it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hello. My name is Michael. And I'm saved. I, don't, I want to invite right now our young people. Some of whom were at camp. Some of whom may have not been. But if you took a stand for Christ, I want you standing at this altar in the next 30 seconds. Come on. We're not going to sing 18 verses of Just As I Am. I lose my guitar player. Alright, we're 28 seconds. Let's go. Now, anyone else who is here who says, I need to be anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit that I may, I may live a life that is not ashamed of the gospel, I want you to join us here at the altar right now. I'm not ashamed. I'm going to take my stand. I'm not going to be silenced. I'm not going to be kept quiet to spread out all over this altar. Okay, spread out over this way. <laughs> Go right up the aisle if you need to be, it doesn't matter. As long as you're standing up, I'm taking a stand. I'm taking a stand. I'm not going to be quiet. I'm not going to be bullied into silence. As you stand here, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. You, you must listen to me. Movements that have changed nations have started with fewer people that are standing here. It does not require great numbers. It does not require great eloquence. It does not require great brilliance. It requires a man or a woman, and I'm speaking to all of you as men and women, not as children. It takes a man or a woman to stand up and say, I will not bend before the heat of this world, but I will speak. Peter looked the Sanhedrin in the eye when they were saying, if you continue to talk like this, we are going to beat you, we are going to imprison you, we are going to kill you. Peter said, you judge whether it be right to obey man or to obey God, but as for me, I cannot but speak that which I have said. I believe that this week, and I believe we've been moving toward it this week, something remarkable has happened in the community of faith, and I believe it's also including us. So right now, I'm going to pray for you. I just want you to bow your heads. I want you to pray. As I pray for you, I want you to pray and ask the Lord Jesus to come into your life in an unprecedented measure. An unprecedented measure of faith. An unprecedented measure of anointing. An unprecedented measure of spiritual gifts. And I would pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would receive spiritual gifts. Some of you are going to receive the anointing to preach. Some of you are going to receive an anointing to teach. Some of you have but are going to have an increased gift of evangelism to reach the lost. There are some of these young people here. I've seen it in you. You have the gift of evangelism. You have it. We've seen it at work. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus, receive from the Holy Spirit the spiritual gifting you need to take your part in the work of the kingdom. Receive it now by faith. Whether it is the anointing to preach, or the anointing to teach, or the anointing to lay hands on the sick that they would be recovered, or the ability to speak the Word of God in a prophetic way, receive it now in the name of Jesus. 
Father, I pray that an anointing would fall upon some of these young people gathered here. I know when they go back to school, I know what they are going to face. And Lord, I pray that maybe for the first time in their life, they stand up and they say, it's more important what Jesus thinks of me than what these friends think of me. And I'm not going to bow, and I'm not going to bend, and I'm not going to yield. And if they put me in a fiery furnace, I will stand there and know that Jesus is with me. Father, we have played church too long. It's time for the church to rise up. And I pray, Father, that every, every person standing at this altar in a sincere desire to become an effective minister of the gospel, Lord, that you would loose our tongues. Loose our tongues when they need to be loosed. And, and bind up our tongues when we need to be quiet. Lord, I pray that when the pushback comes, that none of us will respond with anger and none of us will respond with bitterness and none of us will respond with an unkind way, but we will reflect the cause of Christ. We will reflect the nature of Christ. That we will be gentle. That we will be kind. That we will be good and meek and humble. Lord, there's no room for pride here. We need to stand in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but stand in humility. Speaking the Word of God with boldness. Not being afraid of man. Not being afraid of what man will think. Not being afraid of the consequences. Letting God take care of the consequences. Let us be bold. Let us be like those men who after they were released from their arrest went right back to the same street corner where they were arrested and began anew to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray in Jesus' name anoint with your Holy Spirit. Anoint with your Holy Spirit. Release gifts, O God. May out of this knot of people at this altar, may there emerge preachers and prophets. May there be those with the gift of healing and the gift of exhortation. May there be those here who have pastoral gifts released and evangelistic gifts released, O oh God, released, O oh God. And Father, may we realize that when I leave my house tomorrow, I don't leave as a plumber or an electrician or a nurse or a daycare worker or a student or whatever it is, or a college student. I pray for those, Father, uh, I leave as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I leave as one who is sent from the throne of God to a dying world with a message of hope. And Father, I pray for those college students who are getting ready to leave. We know that their faith is going, in many cases, to come under assault. And we pray for them now in the name of Jesus. Strengthen them. In the name of Jesus, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we see, let Ryan just lead us in a last little chorus here as we worship. You're not a God created by human hands. You're not a God dependent on any mortal man. Amen. He's given us. the way
would pray for those of us here this morning who are making such a powerful commitment that we might understand that when the Holy Spirit resides within us, all of that character of God becomes ours so that we can become unchangeable, unshakable, and unstoppable through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, our nation is depending upon a voice that will carry the message of God. And I believe that generation is standing here today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Tell somebody you love them as you go today.